Welcome to We Mean Business. I'm Steve Dorfman here with Tony Marchanti. Find your courage. Today we're talking with Margie Worrell, and we're talking about how to find your courage uh, at work and in life. Margie is a keynote speaker, master coach, and we're so privileged and pleased to have you with us on the show today. It's great Thank to you. be here. Thanks Thank for you. having me. So we're talking about, of course, your book, Find Your Courage. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, what inspired you, first of all, to write about courage? Ah, you know, I think I wrote the book that I wished I had have been able to read when I was in my 20s mm. and sort of starting out in my career and in life. Because I define courage not as the absence of fear, but action in the presence of it. And I think mm. so often we struggle with those little voices in the back of our heads saying, who are you to do that and you're not good enough and what if you fail and what if people criticize you? So courage is action in the presence of our fear. And so what really inspired me was to help um, other people take action in the presence of their fears because too often I think people kind of live lives that are ruled by fear and they don't do the things they'd really like to do and they don't mm -hmm. speak up about the things they really want to speak up about because they're afraid. Mm -hmm. How much of life is led you know, by fear or because of fear? I think fear has a really profound impact on people's lives. And you know, fear on its own is, is just one of many emotions that we feel as human beings. And so it's not a bad thing to feel afraid. You know, if we hadn't had fear, we'd have all been eaten by saber-toothed tigers mm -hmm. a long time ago. But it's really whether our fears are serving us or not serving us. And I think we have to really kind of tune in and go, well, you know, what's this fear? How's it trying to protect me? Because often, you know, our fears want to keep us safe. We don't want to kind of find ourselves taking a risk and then looking foolish or failing. But if we're always playing safe and if we're never kind of stepping outside our comfort zone and putting ourselves at risk in some way, then we're never going to do the things that we could do and you know, really create the sort of results and relationships and meaning in our lives that we'd like to have. So mm -hmm. uh, I think fear can really keep a lot of people very stifled and trapped in lives that don't mm -hmm. inspire them and mm -hmm. it can really ultimately I think diminish people's experience of being alive yeah okay. yeah I certainly see it a lot you know Tony and I have talked about it and it certainly is uh, everywhere yeah. everywhere, we, everywhere we look so early in the book you talk about the payoffs for not being responsible can mm -hmm. you tell us about that well you know I, I, the first chapter of the book is about taking responsibility and you know the word responsible is broken into two parts response and able so we can't always choose our circumstances, but we're always able to choose how we respond to them. But so often people don't want to take responsibility because it's easier to blame someone else. I'll blame my parents because they didn't raise me right. I'll blame the government. I'll blame my boss. And, you know, we get a payoff from blaming other people because it keeps us being the victim. And, you know, there are people who can be very attached to being the powerless victim. It's not my, there's nothing I can do. It's everybody else. And so there's a, there's a payoff with that because that means they don't have to actually do something about it. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, if you want to change any aspect of your life, you have to take responsibility for your life, for your experience of life. And even there's things you can't always change. It's even choosing how will, how will I respond to it and maybe take a different attitude mm -hmm. toward it. Now, you talk a lot about integrity. Mm -hmm. And I want to first have you... Um, share with us what integrity looks like to you mm -hmm. because I think if we asked people to define yeah. it, they, the definitions would be all over the place. And then, and then talk a little bit about how integrity in, in our personal lives spills over into our business life. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, if you think back to math class, if you can think back that far, I, I stretches <laughs> my, my, my memory, but you know, integers are whole numbers. So integrity to me is about wholeness. Is there an alignment between what you know is the right thing to do and what you're actually doing? And when, there's, when that gets out of alignment, there's a lack of integrity. Mm -hmm. And I really think of integrity as like the foundation stone that you build your life upon. You think of a house, if you built your house on sand and the wind blows, you know, it'll fall down. So having like a really robust commitment to having uncompromised integrity. Am I doing what I know is right? You know, to thine own self be true. Or where am I cutting corners and, you know, there's a little white lie here and cutting a corner there. And ultimately, I think that can have a big impact on you know, as we move forward in our relationships or in our careers or building a business, wherever there's sort of a crack in the integrity, ultimately that can kind of have the whole house of cards falling down. Mm -hmm. uh, so as far as the importance of that, really, you know, when I think of people we really admire as leaders, 
there's, they have such un uncompromised integrity. We know that they mean what they say and they say what they mean. That they'll do what's right even when it's not politically expedient. That they're not going to cut corners just because that's the easy, convenient thing to do. And I, I think the same goes whether it's in our small business or in our leadership managing a team of people in any relationships that we have. But I think it was Gandhi that once said, whenever you are doing wrong in any area of your life, it affects every area of your life. Life mm -hmm. is one indivisible whole. <coughs> and I think that's so true. And I, I get my coaching clients and when I speak, you know, I often talk about have a look at where in your life is there maybe, you know, a little compromise to how you're running things because whenever there's a lack of integrity, it does rub off and affect other areas of life. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. I, um, I once heard, uh, without integrity, nothing works. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And um, there, was no, there was another great quote. I, I, I'm not sure I'll get it right, but it was something like, uh, something like, um, uh, I, I, actually, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> I, it, it's, it's something about it, how integrity, um, you know, it's either there or it's not, and you know it when it's there or it's yeah. not, and it's just an obvious thing. Yeah. Actually, one of my a quote that I love is, and I and I don't know who I, I think it's anonymous, but there are many paths you can follow in life. Integrity is the only one upon which you will never get lost. Mm. And you know, it's like a compass. It's, is this the right thing to do? And sometimes, even in your career, it's like ah, oh, the right thing to do can have a cost to it. it it's not always easy to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it takes a lot of self awareness and being, you know, brutally honest with ourselves sometimes. That's what really is the right thing to do here. Yeah. It reminds me of when you were sitting in these big, or I used to work for a large restaurant company, and you'd have these big, massive meetings, and the VP of operations up there said, Who has an idea about something, something? And everyone's like, you know, looking around, <laughs> and no one's. And in, to, be, to, to be true to yourself, you have plenty of ideas, but nobody wanted to say yeah. them. And then they would say, Well, why don't. Why doesn't anybody speak up? Because when you put your ideas out there, yeah. they would just crush them all. Mm. Right. But instead of creating an, a, a true open environment of communication, mm -hmm. it was just this very, mm -hmm. you know, malaligned sure. thing to, mm -hmm. to deal with. It was just a waste of time. Sure. Yeah. So it's so easy to be to be forthcoming and just say, this is what yeah. I think, and yeah. put yourself out there a bit. Yeah, and there's so many lessons in that experience for you because creating an environment of safety where people feel free to speak up right. is so important. Right. But, you know, I think often when, you know, integrity it's from our commitment to integrity often that we can find our courage because we might not want to do something but we know we just have to mm -hmm. I have to do this because I can't live with myself if I don't mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um, and I think yeah, a lot of great people go off and do extraordinary things and it's not always easy but it's because they just know that not doing it would have them so you know not sleeping well at night but they just mm -hmm. have to go and do it that kind of calling to and I think it's such a compass for, uh, for other people even if you don't mm -hmm. realize that how much you're leading other people yeah. by saying, you know, I'm going to get up early and go and do my thing early or do whatever you got to do, yeah. people all look at your ethics and say, wow, you yeah. know, just always doing, doing that right thing. I think, and, and integrity to me, you know, we look at our leaders and, yeah, we want them to be smart and competent and have, a, you know, great business acumen or, you know, whether it's organization leaders or it's in politics. But, you know, integrity is that one, you know, that character trait that if we suspect that that's not 100%, mm. you know, it kind of diminishes everything else that they might be good at. You know, we really want to know that they absolutely are a person of integrity, even mm -hmm. if we disagree with them, that they still have integrity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, you talk in the book, you tell a story about several years ago how you took a journey through Thailand mm -hmm. and you were watching the behavior of some elephants and what that taught you about the stories, mm -hmm. quote unquote stories that we all live with. I'd love to hear more about that. Oh, sure. So. As many Australians do, I went backpacking for a year after I finished college. I was 21 and uh, traveled through the US and Europe, ended up in Thailand. And I was in this village in the very north of Thailand in the Golden Triangle area where I kind of went on this hike through the jungle. And one night we were sitting in this little, like, very basic hut and I noticed these big elephants weren't wandering off into the jungle. And I said to, like, the guy that was leading the little group, you know, how come they don't wander off? They're like these huge, massive 14-foot, 4-ton elephants. And he said, when they're young, they put a, a bracelet around their leg and they tie them with a rope to a tree or a stake in the village. And so they try to wander off and they realize they can't. And when they're two or three, they take the rope away, but they leave the bracelet, you know, around their leg. And these elephants, they don't try to go off after that because they've been conditioned to believe that they can't. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, how silly, you know, they could wander off and they don't. 
And as the years went by, I realized how much as human beings we are so similar to the elephants mm. and that we're told when we're young, you can do this and you can't do that and you've got a strength at that, but oh, you don't have a strength at that. Mm. And we sort of buy into these stories about what we can do and what we can't do and it keeps us from then exploring other possibilities for sort of, you know, saying, well, what's beyond the horizon over there? And we end up like living these lives that are very confined based on beliefs that aren't necessarily true at all that we've just sort of bought into, either consciously or unconsciously. Mm -hmm. So great. Good story. Uh, you also talk about dreaming big. And I wonder, because you know, we, we see those folks that have, that have dreamed big and they've, you know, they've gone on to conquer the world and create these amazing things. And you see other people that are dreaming big and it seems almost delusional. So how, what's a good gauge you know, for dreaming big? How do, you, how do you know when it's just yeah. you've gone too far? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think, um, well, Michelangelo said, the greater danger is not that our dreams are too lofty and we fail to achieve them. It's that they're too small and we do. Mm. And so, uh, you know, I encourage people to think bigger about what's possible for them because I think most people fail a lot more from, you know, dream, thinking really small than from thinking too big. Mm. And, and, you know, in my work, I don't usually come across people who are thinking way too big, you know, bigger than that's what's possible for them. Usually it's people who are kind of settling for a lot less than what they really want. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, one is to create the vision. What is it that inspires you? And two is then to create a plan that's going to get you there. Because, you know, all talk of vision and dreams and everything and a lack of planning and rigor and doing your homework and you know being realistic about what you can do and what you can't do and getting the right resources in you know you're not going to achieve it so I think create the vision it starts with the vision you're never going to get into action unless you've got the vision but then okay what do I need to do to achieve it and mm -hmm. you know is it realistic or not I think you know time kind of proves whether or not something is realistic but I think it's not really that important whether or not you ever ultimately achieve the vision that inspires you as much as you feel a sense of purpose in your day-to-day -day life because you've got something that you're working toward that really makes you feel like your life is meaningful mm -hmm. I think of Mother Teresa you know she wanted to end world hunger did she achieve it no Martin Luther King you know you think of so many of these incredible leaders who had these enormous visions they didn't necessarily achieve what they set out to, but they led extraordinary lives because they, I guess, had the courage to just say, I dare to dream this big. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I very rarely do I feel like, oh, people are just dreaming way too big. We've got to ground mm -hmm. them down. Most of the time, it's like, you know what, you need to think a bit bigger. Yeah. When you think about the, uh, the ingredient of courage when it comes mm -hmm. to leadership and, the, and that mm -hmm. magic ingredient in leadership, um, how is it uh, that you see... Uh, that ingredient playing out in the way that the leader is being perceived by their staff. How important is that? Uh, it, very important because how you're being perceived matters enormously. Uh, and I think courage is a, is a fundamental ingredient for solid and effective leadership because we look to our leaders to create visions for our team or our business. You know, we want to be inspired by a leader who is inspired themselves. And so, you know, for them to create a vision it needs to be have a certain element of boldness in it. You know, if it's absolutely a shoe in that you're going to achieve everything in the next six months, it's not big enough. There needs to be that element that we all have to stretch ourselves to go to, to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, and but a leader needs to be able to enrol other people in their vision. If they've got a big vision and no one's buying into it, or they feel like there's a lack of alignment between what their leader is saying they want to achieve and then what they're doing and how they're acting. You know, then that, that's going to filter down and ripple into the organization. People will become pretty disillusioned and jaded and they're not going to be a very effective leader. So I think creating that vision, <coughs> engaging other people, getting people enrolled in that, and then leading them, um, getting them inspired to do things they otherwise wouldn't do, which to me is a really big distinction between leadership and management. You know, a manager is sort of saying, this is how we do it, this is how you chop the tree down. A leader's up the top looking and saying, oh, let's, we're in the wrong forest, let's go somewhere else. Or, you know, they're really thinking bigger all the time. Uh -huh. Well, we've got to go to a quick break. Okay. And when we come back, I want to ask you, because in, in, the, in the book, of course, in the subtitle, uh, you talk about the 12 acts of everyday courage. And uh -huh. so I'd love for you to share just a couple of those sure. with, our, with our audience Great. when we come back. So you're watching We Mean Business. We'll be back in seconds. You realize that 49 million Americans struggle with hunger? That's one out of every six Americans. 
These people are around us every day. They're our friends, they're our co-workers, their kids go to school with our kids. Sometimes we're not even aware that they're struggling. This problem is closer than you think. So is the solution. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Welcome back to We Mean Business. I'm Steve Dorfman here with Tony Marchanti, and our guest today is Margie Worrell. Margie is an author, master coach, and keynote speaker, and we're talking about her book, Find Your Courage, today. So the subtitle of the book talks about the 12 acts for becoming fearless at work mm -hmm. and in life. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are a couple of those acts that we can do every day? Well, you know, it's interesting. We've touched on a few already about taking responsibility, living with integrity, challenging your stories like the elephant, you know, challenging what is it when we, when we think we can't do something, it's like, well, who says? And, and challenging how we see the world. Um, but it, obviously, we probably won't get through them all. But, you know, one of the big ones is to just step into action, to take action, because it's very easy to talk about things and it gets a lot more difficult to actually do it. So it's really important in life to be willing to just create a plan, a roadmap. Here's where I am. Here's where I want to go. What are the things that I need to do and to stop doing to get me from where I am to where I want to go? And that really does sometimes require just taking that big, deep breath and stepping forward. And whether it's, you know, looking out for the new job or speaking up in a conversation or, you know, getting brushing off our resume and, and you know, looking at applying for another job. But stepping into action is really where the rubber hits the road. And so often we procrastinate and we come up with all sorts of reasons about why now's not a good time, I'm too young, I'm too old, and it's nothing is, is, I guess, rewarded more in life than just being in action on a daily basis toward whatever it is that we have sort of set our sights on. Uh, and in line with that, another, another chapter of the book is the courage to speak up. Because as human beings, you know, we live in our relationships with other people and so often issues come up in relationships and we don't address them. We don't get them on the table. And we sort of fester on them and they, mm. you know, stew away and the next thing you know, a few months down the track or a few years sometimes, they just sort of explode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, what comes out of our mouth is often not very pretty. Uh, or else it festers and we grow an ulcer or get sick, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's so important to find the courage to speak up. Yeah to ask for what we want from people, uh, to address issues, to give the feedback to somebody, an employee, even though we know they're not going to want to hear it, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, we need to give it because it's, it's important that they hear this. Or to speak up in a meeting even though we're not sure how our opinion is going to be received. So, you know, just stepping into action, whether it's in our conversations uh, or, you know, in our actions, I think are some really important, courageous things we need to do on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, we spoke briefly at the break about emotional intelligence. Can uh -huh. you tell us how that kind of works into courage and fearlessness? Sure, and sure. Well, you know, EQ, Daniel Goleman wrote a book on this about 15 years ago called Emotional Intelligence. And it's been found now, they've done a lot of clinical studies, that emotional intelligence is a far stronger predictor of success than IQ. You know, actually up to 80% of success is attributed to your emotional intelligence versus your IQ. And, you know, being really, really smart, you know, on a, on a test doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be successful in life. As mm -hmm. You've probably experienced uh, yourself. You meet these street smart versus book smart. Yeah, smart. very brainiac -y kind of people mm -hmm. who do really dumb things. So, <laughs> um, so emotional intelligence is really about being aware of what's going on for me, being able to manage our own emotions, kind of tuned in what's going on for those around me, and ultimately how do I influence those around me, how can I be a catalyst for change, and ultimately be a leader that, that gets people and produces results that, you know, through other people as well. So emotional intelligence is, is obviously very connected to courage because fear is one of the main emotions. And so being intelligent about how we manage our fear, you know, just being tuned in, well, what is it I'm afraid of here? And is this serving me or is this actually holding me back? And then being able to step through that fear into action. And the same applies to the other core emotions, whether it's anger, or sadness, or you know, when people get very resigned at some times, they become very unmotivated. Kind of being able to tune in, what are, what are the, some of the emotions that are going on for me and where are they sabotaging my success, holding me back, undermining my relationships or my effectiveness with others? And I think once we're tuned in, then we have 
well, then we're in a much better place to actually sort of manage them because if we don't own our emotions, they end up owning us and mm -hmm. sort of running the show. Mm -hmm. how, how far down, you know, which, uh, my thought on, in getting ready for the show was about kids a little bit too and mm -hmm. how kids are fearless and kids are just straight and they have ideas and they're just excited and we, oh. we, we've had other guests to talk about you know where the, where that path gets lost ah it's true where, what do you think on on that topic i have so many thoughts on this topic i have four children myself yeah. so uh and and what's, each, the, what's the age range by the way they are my youngest is eight my oldest is 13. okay so they're pretty cl close in age mm -hmm. yeah. and and they're all different which is interesting because you know our children despite the fact they have the same parents and the same house they live in they they can be so different in how they mm -hmm. respond to life some of them are more sensitive some of them are more fearless others a little bit more timid um but yeah kids <clears> kind of come out they think big i'm going to be an astronaut and i'm going to be mm -hmm. a you know an actress and then they're sort of like you know or oh, let's become a, a teacher and an accountant not that there's anything wrong with one profession versus another but let's play safe let's do what's you know realistic you know don't think too big and I know myself growing up I, you know my my mother was sort of I wanted to be a journalist and she said oh darling you know you don't read the paper you don't know what's going on enough in the media and it was true at the time but that wasn't to say that I couldn't have been I think you know she just wanted to protect me mm -hmm. from disappointment so I think as parents, we have such a crucial role in encouraging our kids and giving them the tools they need. One is encouraging them to think big and it's like, what is it that excites you? Because what, exci what excites one person doesn't necessarily, you're a chef. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I wouldn't want to be a chef outside <laughs> my own kitchen. But thank goodness there are wonderful people who want to be chefs. Because, right. But even for our children, encouraging that individuality and encouraging that what they dream of. But then giving them the tools so that when life doesn't unfold the way they want, that they don't interpret that as meaning that they're a failure when things fail. It just means that they tried something and it didn't work out. It doesn't mean they're a failure. Um, and helping them build their own resilience and capacity to cope with some of the setbacks, disappointments, difficult people, critical people that they're inevitably going to deal with, including starting with the kids on the playground who say, you know, you can't do that or you're not very fast or you're, mm -hmm. not, you're not very good at math. You know, how do you help give them those tools so that they build their own resilience and they process some of those life experiences in positive ways. It kind of reminds me of the football team or the teams where everybody wins a prize. Mm -hmm. And it's like yeah. nobody, nobody wants to fail. And, and yeah. failure yeah. in any great great achievement, they've failed yeah. plenty of times. We're not all athletes and we're yeah. not all mathematicians and we're yeah. not all mu musicians, you know. And, and I think it doesn't mean you don't encourage all of it. But right. I think ultimately kids, my experience is people generally feel passionate about doing something that they have some innate talent in. Uh, you know, I you know I don't want to be uh, climb Mount Everest, but you know what? I probably wouldn't be very good at it either. So, but and our kids, you know, when they're young, they might want to be everything, but they often is a sort of a bent that they naturally have, and usually that lines up with where they have some sort of talent, even if maybe they're never going to be the world famous singer. But it could be something that's there's some parallel with what they actually might be called to do later in life. Yeah, I mean, I always find so much passion in giving you know credit to people that have a decision. I want to do something, whether it's clean the streets or be a, yeah. an opera singer, that they're choosing something and having the courage to say, yes, this is what I do, yeah. this is what I like to do, and this is what I'm going to be good at. And uh, sometimes on our way to doing what we think we want to do, we find something yeah. else. And we go, you know what, I thought I wanted to do that, mm -hmm. but actually mm -hmm. now that I'm kind of moving along, I think I really would rather go this direction. But we would never know that unless we pursued the direction. And I, I often say that to college grads and you know people in their early 20s, and they're like, oh, you know, what am I doing? Like, do what you think you want to do, and if you decide you don't want to do that, fantastic. Now you know you don't want to do it, and you'll, you'll go off, but do something. You know, right. Don't sit on the fence saying, I'm not choosing anything because yeah. I don't want to make a mistake. Yeah. Just choose what you think it is and move forward. You, mm -hmm. know, you can change direction. A lot of people change direction. Yeah, it's like the big question, what do you want to be in life? It's like, well, how many, you, know, you can be a hundred <laughs> things in life. It's done. You don't lock it down for one, time, yeah. one decision, yeah. and you're done. Uh, what do you recommend to small business owners that have... Um, a smaller team to lead, but needs certainly a lot of courage, especially the last mm -hmm. couple of years. Mm -hmm. We've we've all had mm -hmm. to challenge, you know, yeah. face a lot of challenges. What do you? What's some advice for them? I, I think there there's lots of challenges, but there's also so many great opportunities. And the thing with being a small business owner is you have the nimbleness to sort of change and adjust sales pretty quickly. Where in mm -hmm. big organisations you can't. You know, sometimes you're just so much more married to a long-term strategy than 
you know, when you're a small business, you can adjust things. So I think continually reflecting on, okay, is this, are we going in the direction we want to be going? Is this working? And if it's not working, change direction. You know, in the old, 20 years ago, we used to say, persevere, persevere, persevere. And I have a chapter in my book on perseverance. It's important. But if you're going to fail or if things aren't working, fail quickly. You know, this isn't working. This is clearly not working, this strategy. We haven't got the results we wanted. Okay, let's, let's just bench that one and try something else. Because moving on, and you talked earlier about having a dream, and, you know, some people have these huge dreams and, you know, they're just too big. But if we're moving towards something and it's just not happening, well, maybe it's a sign that something's just amiss here and we need to go back to the drawing board and look at what it is and and revisit that. So. Well, especially in, in the technology sector now, I mean, people fail their startups and failures every every year mm -hmm. and hundreds mm -hmm. and thousands of them. But, it, you know, once again, like a personal struggle, you have to try it to see if it works. Yeah, I mean, they say there. the only mistake you make is one you don't learn from. And, mm -hmm. and we all make mistakes. And I think the people who are really successful aren't the people who've made the fewest mistakes. Right. You know, they've made mistakes and they've gone, ah, oh, okay, lesson what not to do. Don't do that, don't do that, try this. And continually adjusting the formula, the recipe. And obviously at the moment, the world changes so fast technologically, so many ways. It's such a rapidly changing environment. So we need to be really willing, quick, quick on it to be changing what we're doing and adjusting to that. Is you know, think of the social media stuff. You know, you can very quickly become a woolly mammoth. You know, mm -hmm. in the business environment today. So being, I think, just tuned in, looking around, and you know, engaging the people around you in a small business, making sure that your team is fully engaged with what you're about. I think is is obviously crucial too. As as we get towards the end of it, uh, personal branding. We talked about social media, and uh -huh. I think personal uh -huh. branding. Relates well uh, to me. I was thinking about having the courage to step out of your your comfort zone. Uh -huh. Means that you may have some negative impacts. You might lo lose a you know. You might be on a path to be out of a job. Per, you know, perhaps. What do you think about personal branding and building your own kind of environment around yourself so that you're always safe in what you're doing because you're you you are extending yourself in that direction for your own self. Well, you know, I, I, being being true to who it is 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 obviously crucial, and personal branding obviously has become a hot topic in the last, mm -hmm. I guess, 10 years probably. You know, it's you, Inc. Uh, and I think we are our own personal brand. I mean, every one of us has an identity for people around us. They think of you and they think, Steve, they think, you know, there'll, there'll be a whole lot of things that will come to mind when people think of us. And in the social media, there's so much more opportunity now to put that brand out there. And, you know, sometimes we have to, we kind of go, oh, you know what, I want to adjust my sales a little bit on, mm -hmm. on the branding front too. But there's a huge opportunity there given social media to, to brand ourselves and um, doing something that is in alignment with who we are. I think when you try and brand yourself and it's really not in alignment, it's not congruent, it comes up so quickly. I mean, people just, even it's kind of not even something that people are consciously aware of, but it's something like, ah, oh, this just doesn't fit. Who this person says they are and mm -hmm. I just don't get that there's a fit. So whatever it is, how you want to brand yourself, if you, you know, in marketing yourself, whether it's a business or you're a solopreneur, just making sure it's very congruent with mm -hmm. who you are. Perfect. All right, Margie, I'm challenging you. 30 seconds or less, tell us about the relationship between courage and forgiveness. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, you know, forgiveness to me is so important in life because when you hold on to anger, it's like swallowing a bottle of poison and waiting for the other person to die. Mm -hmm. So it's not always, it's not about the other person letting them off the hook. It's about letting yourself off the hook. Mm -hmm. And it takes courage to forgive people because, you know, there's so much in, invested in not forgiving. Sometimes mm -hmm. we have a lot invested in our anger and holding on to it and claiming hold of that victim state. Mm -hmm. So I think it takes courage to let go of that and go, you know what, it, it happened, it's done, and I'm not going to carry that forward with me weighing me down like a chain and, you know, a ball around my ankle moving forward. Mm -hmm. You exceeded my challenge. Thank you so much. Oh. Yeah, I was <laughs> 27, 28, 29. We, we could spend a couple hours with Margie. This has been fantastic. Very Thanks good. so much for joining it's us today. It's been a pleasure. A real you. pleasure. So you've been watching We Mean Business. To learn more about Margie Worrell, you can visit WeMeanBiz.tv. For Tony Marshanti and myself, Steve Dorfman, thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.